uh, I remind that uh, Mr. Salzer will be in the workshop number two. So nice to join in this workshop. And uh, the next from the roots to more management of those roots, I ask Chiara Celerino, um, professor and researcher from uh, Genova University, to share more about the management. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dan, and to the <coughs> organizer for having me here. Uh, I have this quite ambitious task today to try to bring the mediation debate to another layer, and uh, mainly to the sphere of uh, international relations. So mediation as a tool to solve disputes among uh, international parties. And as uh, usually lawyers like to do, I, I start with some uh, definitional issues uh, to curtail a bit the scope of, of the analysis. And uh, so, what is a dispute among, uh, what is an international dispute? Well, we have a quite convincing definition from the Romanian Court of International Justice. Uh, it's a disagreement over a point of view of, of law or fact, a conflict of legal views or interest. Uh, fine, this is valid also for the internal level. Um, when a dispute becomes international, when it involves governments, institutions, physical or legal persons belonging to different legal orders. But today, we won't deal with all the international or transnational disputes between private parties. We only deal with disputes <coughs> between governments, so between states. Or, conflicts that are intrastate, so within one state, but if protracted, may endanger international security. So they have an implication on international security. Uh, the starting point uh, is that in international relations, the debate we have witnessed uh, at internal level did not involve the international sphere. There is no debate on alternative dispute resolution or mediation for international relations. Why? Because probably mediation was born in international relations. Because the relations among states always used alternative dispute resolution methods to solve the disputes. Because states are uh, superior and non recognitions. They don't acknowledge any superior authority to tell them what to do. So when they need to solve a dispute among them, they either use war, or since the end of the 19th century, and the, the, the United Nations establishment, they are not allowed to use war anymore, at least in principle, and they should are obliged to use peaceful settlement methods. And these methods are listed in the UN Charter. And you see highlighted those that have a diplomatic character, so not a adjudicative method. And we see negotiation, angry, mediation, conciliation. So mediation is inherent to international relations. Um, and by contrast to adjudicative method, diplomatic methods uh, have these characteristics that require the consent of states along all the process, because states reach a solution of the disputes only if they want to do so at the to enter a mediation process at the beginning and they keep the consent all along the process till the end of the agreement. Whereas when we are um, dealing with a judicative method, by contrast to the internal level, we still need consent because states cannot be obliged to solve their disputes. There is not a superior authority, an, inter an international court or tribunal that has compulsory jurisdiction on international rights. There is an international court of justice. There are many international tribunals and courts that flourished after the end of the Second World in particular. But always when states resort to 
these uh, judicial methods, they must have accepted the jurisdiction. Otherwise, they cannot be brought to court. So consent is a prerequisite of both adjudicative method and diplomatic method in international relations. But the difference is that the diplomatic methods, in the adjudicative method, the consent is given at the beginning, and then we have a binding decision of a tribunal of a court. Whereas in mediation, negotiations, uh, there is never a binding decision of anybody. The states must consent to the solution of the disputes, also to the peace agreement. Um, so let's go through some of them, the most relevant for us, very quickly. Uh, negotiation. Negotiation is indeed the most popular means of settlement of international disputes. Why states like it? Because there is no involvement of third parties. They can retain the control on the dispute. So they talk to each other, but they can always choose to pull out of the process and uh, leave things as they are. Um, and, uh, the majority of disputes among states is so through negotiation diplomatic negotiations and sometimes mediation. This is not very uh, very well known. There is a general lack of information on these kind of processes because they tend to be not secret but at least very confidential. But this is the truth. Uh, adjudicative methods are comparatively rare. Um, when negotiation doesn't work, when the position of the parties are too far apart, and so it's basically, they don't even talk to each other. Or maybe one party is where is a, there is an inequality of power, so one state is particularly weak or feels weak, and doesn't want to enter negotiations because it fears of losing it. In such cases, we then have these other methods that can be of great help. So good offices and mediation. This, it's hard to distinguish, they tend to merge, but what is the point here that we involve a third party? The third party that helps the party to start talking to each other again. In uh, good offices, the role of the mediator is slightly um, uh, softer. It's more a channel of communication, whereas the mediation, international mediation, the mediator is more active uh, and makes proposals to solve uh, the disputes. Then we have conciliation and anguish. Conciliation is kind of a midway between uh, mediation and adjudicative methods because the conciliator makes independent fast fact investigations. Uh, but in any case, uh, the proposal for set settlement must be accepted by the parties. So this is a kind of a midway between uh, a court and a mediator. And then we have inquiry, but we don't deal with it today. Um, What are the conditions for entering a mediation process at international level and the hardship that international relations uh, find? We need the consent of states to mediation and a willing mediator. The willing mediator must not be given for granted. Several times it's not easy to find a mediator available to solve the Why? It's true that uh, becoming a mediator of an international dispute can be interesting for states. For example, smaller countries to improve their relations with superpowers. Or sometimes states that uh, candidate for mediation process uh, are interested in the solution of the dispute for some reason. And here you see some uh, examples of However, mediation is also an expensive process. It requires a lot of diplomatic effort. It might jeopardize existing alliances, and there is no guarantee of success, as we all know. So several disputes could not be mediated because no willing mediator was available in the international relations. Uh, and then consent to the mediation process. What is the hardship here? that when state or governments uh, decide to accept the mediation, they kind of acknowledge the international relevance of their dispute. And this uh, might have implications for their accountability. 
Furthermore, they must be, they know that when they enter a mediation process, they must be ready to compromise. They must have to give up something at least, otherwise there is no chance of success. So it's not always uh, uh, the case that they are willing to enter this kind of process, even though interim decisions might be expensive to defend also in the, in the eyes of public. Um, these problems are even uh, more uh, amplified in the new types of conflicts that are arising in the recent uh, history of uh, international relations. After a general rise, uh, oh, sorry, a, a general decrease of conflicts in uh, until the end of the Cold War, there has uh, been a rise of conflicts in the last decades. However, these conflicts have slightly changed in their nature. They are not anymore, or at least not only interstate conflicts, but uh, they have become mainly intrastate conflicts, low intensity confrontations um, within one state and involving very sensitive interests. Think of ethnic conflicts. For example, within the same state, if protracted, these conflicts might endanger international peace. And we have seen it very clearly, for example, in the recent history of Exodus Lake. Um, but it's just one example. Um, so, because of this change of natural conflicts, the UN has engaged again on mediation as a tool for the solution of international disputes. And a new momentum has uh, arisen. Mediation uh, is seen as a flexible, cost effective, capable to be implemented at different levels tools, and the UN invested in this tool. In 2011, the General Assembly asked the Secretary General to adopt guidance for governments, for international organizations, to get engaged in mediation processes for the solution of international conflicts. And, uh, uh, the guide was issued in uh, 2011. It's an interesting document. We don't go through it uh, today, but we have it in the materials that I gave uh, for uh, the book. And it go gives a lot of practical hints uh, for the conduction of mediation processes in this kind of conflicts that we have mentioned uh, before. The guide sees an important role in the engagement in mediation for international organizations. So of course, the UN it has a primary, a leading role in this field, has a long standing experience in mediation. The Secretary General offered its services as an international mediation in many international disputes, but we also have regional organizations that are even more apt uh, <coughs> entities to uh, conduct this process. Why? Because they are closer to the understanding of political, social, cultural, economic backgrounds of the conflict. Uh, so we have OSCE, um, the African Union, and here we come to the European Union, which is the entity I want to talk to you about. Uh, the UA is a successful example of conflict, conflict prevention in itself, because uh, it was based on the idea of creating peace among member states, the enlargement process is aimed to extend the scope of this method also to a wider number of uh, European states and in its external relations, the EU tries to purport its values and use the diplomatic method as well. Um, the EU is present as a mediator in uh, nearly all areas of the world. Uh, you have some, uh, some uh, uh, example there, uh, but not always the EU act as a mediator directly. It's only in two current conflicts this is happening. And this is the dialogue between Serbia and Kosovo uh, and uh, the Georgian conflict within the Geneva discussion. There the EU is directly engaged. But in several other con international conflicts, the EU is more as a supporter of mediation process through different roles, for example, financing mediation uh, at different levels, leveraging mediation through political support, promoting it, 
or supporting the mediation effort of other organizations. And this is what is going on in Ukraine, for example, example or in Libya, where the UN is up. <coughs> um, and here we come to my final point. Is the EU alone in this role? No. The EU has, is an international actor. It's a state-like entity sometimes, or act as a state-like entity, even though it is an international organization. But also member states are active, remain active in their international relations. And this is sometimes a problem, because uh, mediation efforts are not coordinated. And when member states have strong interests in an international dispute, think of the Palestine uh, conflict, uh, then the mediation of the EU is harder to get underway because you have a member state that act in not a coordinated way. But where the EU is cohesive, when no member state has interest, strong interest in a dispute, think of Indonesia, there the effort of the EU was much more successful because the EU managed to be to speak with a single voice. So the presence of member states is sometimes a problem to the effectiveness of the effort. Other times, though, it is an asset. In the Ukrainian crisis, for example, we had uh, France and Germany that brokered the ceasefire agreement in 2015. The EU supported the effort of the member states on a political level, using other leverage instruments. And then the OSCE, so a third organization, uh, followed the implementation of that. So you see that cooperation among actors and coherence of these efforts, member states, you, other organizations, might bring positive uh, issues. So here I just gave you some flavor of uh, a topic that is indeed a classic topic of international law. And we can maybe hope that the new momentum for mediation from the UN, from the EU, the new activism of the EU that is trying to make more systematic its approach to mediation in international conflict prevention and solution will kind of uh, uh, open the path for a new era of mediation in international relations and maybe a more likely debate also on this <coughs> international scene. Thank you.